Good evening. We've got quite a crew. Nobody, uh, lo everybody's looking uh, like tomorrow's going to be a little warm. And I, I tell you, I, I think the AC in here could be better and given a check up, a tune up too. So yeah, I'm, this is what I'm wearing. I'm, I'm really going to be radical tomorrow morning. I think I'm going to wear shorts and a polo. So not that you need to know that, but it's warm. It's warm. So, uh, yeah, eighth Sunday, eighth Sunday after Pentecost. A, a couple of words that were um, looking at the words public ministry. Usually when I hear those words public ministry, I think of, of oh, pastors, teachers, staff ministers, somebody who does ministry on behalf of somebody else. Uh, a, a, a teacher, a, a pastor is called by other Christians to, to do ministry. Uh, not necessarily for them replacing their own ministry, but that's part of what we're talking about here, uh, is, is that term public ministry. It's just not just a, a teacher, staff minister, pastor thing. Public ministry is doing ministry in public, right? And who of us as Christians don't live in the public and, and doing ministry, doing service, doing Jesus to, to people around us, public ministry. So keep that in mind uh, as we go through our service tonight. Um... I don't think there's anything uh, special that we need to remind you of before, so let's, let's get started. Let's get started with our first hymn. That's hymn 227. Would you please stand? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Thank you. Christian friends, we are gathered to worship the triune God who has saved us from our sins and who reminds us of his promises and future blessings. Let us worship that triune God not only in this service, but throughout the week as we live our lives. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God, our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. 
but I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Father has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for all our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the, pe oh, in the Holy Spirit, in the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. together we pray almighty God we thank you for planting the seed of your word in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit help us receive and grow in it with joy and to show that joy by how others see our faith and hope and love through your son Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first scripture lesson when we're talking about public ministry. I, I see a, a, a huge connection here, public ministry of, you know, again, it's not just those pastors that grow on a pastor tree or a teacher that grow on a teacher tree, uh, that kind of public ministry thing. When you think of Amos 
and the ministry that he was doing. Uh, he, he, was a, he was a farmer. He was in the middle of plowing a field, blue-collar farmer as, as long as the day is. And when God called him to be uh, a prophet of him and to preach to the northern kingdom of Israel. And so a little context here when, when you see Amos, uh, Amos chapter 7 there, you see the name Amaziah, you see the name Jeroboam, that, that Amaziah was a false prophet, was um, a false prophet that uh, the northern kingdom, the, the king, king Jeroboam uh, was a, a wicked king, and, and Amaziah, Amaziah and Jer Jeroboam were on the same side, so to speak. And so they didn't like this Amos coming in and preaching the truth, preaching the message that God was telling Amos to preach to Jeroboam and to Amaziah. And so here's this reaction that Amaziah and, uh, and uh, Jeroboam have towards the, the public ministry of, of Amos. And you see the connection there. All of us, all of us are in this public ministry. So Amos, chapter 7. <clears throat> Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all his words, for this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will surely go into exile, away from their native land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy anymore at Bethel because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. That's our first lesson. Going to go through a new hymn. Would you refer to your insert? We're going to change the instructions there a little bit. Where's mine? Oh, I don't have one. Can I share one? Thank you. That what we're going to do for this new hymn on the insert, His Mercy is No More, on the back side of the picture one, that Alicia is going to play through the melody once. Uh, Mr. Marcraft and I will do a duet and sing through uh, verse 1 together, just he and I. And then after we're done with verse 1, that's when we'd say, okay, the rest of you maybe, hopefully, get a little bit of an idea what the melody is. And then we'll sing together verses 1, 2, and 3. Make sense? All right, here we go.
Thanks, Aaron. That's kind of a neat hip, eh? Our second lesson here tonight, coming from the Gospel of St. Mark, Mark chapter 7. Um, doing public ministry again when you think of the, the disciples, uh, the normal guys that they were. It's not like those, those disciples were students at some seminary somewhere over there in, in Galilee or anything. You know, fishermen, tax collector, doctor, what have you. Um, normal guys. And, and here, you can kind of kind of see this as part of their seminary training, maybe like their vicar year that, that Jesus sends them out two by two to do ministry. And as they're doing ministry, public ministry, he also says, don't, wor don't worry about it. The folks to whom you preach and teach, uh, they, they have the responsibility, the privilege of, of supporting you. Um, do one thing. What a, what a blessing it is to not have to say, oh, I got to work at McDonald's in order to, to um, supplement my income. It's a blessing, truly a blessing that um, I don't, we don't forget as your called workers. Mark chapter 6. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. And that's our second scripture lesson. Let's join confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Here we go. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In 452.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you all from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends, we take walks, people take walks for all kinds of different reasons. You drive on 25th Street there on the west side of Skyview Lake and you see people walking there all the time. I would imagine, I didn't go by there today, but even on a hot day like today, I would imagine people were walking. Any number of reasons to go for a walk. Maybe you see somebody walking with a four-legged friend. Maybe you see somebody walking with a two-legged friend or two that you go for a walk simply for the exercise. What a good time, good thing to get exercise for me and Fido. Good thing to get exercise while I can visit with my friend. Maybe I go for a walk to decompress. I had a long day. I just need to decompress a little bit and so I go for a walk all by myself in the neighborhood. It's not uncommon for me to wake up early in the mornings, and I do this especially when I'm traveling, maybe like you're camping or something. I wake up early, and instead of waking somebody else in the motel room or the tent or what have you, I go for a walk. I like to see the sunrise. I've seen beautiful sunrises all over, the buttes of Fort Robinson, seeing the sunrise take a walk on the shores of the Sea of Galilee in Israel. It's a morning guy taking a walk thing. John, the disciple, the Apostle John, is the author of our text here tonight. This is the same John, one of the twelve. This is the same John when you think of kind of an inner circle, an inner circle of friends that Jesus had. Remember who those three disciples were? Peter, James, and John. Three guys that more than once or twice Jesus picked to say, Hey, you guys, come join me, do this. Peter, James, and John, join me on the Mount of Transfiguration. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, who were the three guys that he said, come with me, encourage me, support me, Peter, James, and John. John seems to be the only one of the twelve that was there at the crucifixion. It was John to whom Jesus gave the responsibility of taking care of his mother. John was one of the twelve, one of those apostles who was sent out by Jesus to do mission work, public ministry. And it certainly looks like this public ministry that he did was in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, going to congregations that St. Paul, missionary Paul, had started there in Asia Minor in Turkey. And John is running into a situation, uh, problems in, in many of these congregations that is not unlike things in reality today. The big fancy word is Gnosticism. It's a Greek word, Gnosticism. It, it means wisdom, that people were thinking, boy, this Bible thing isn't wise enough. This is, just isn't cool enough. You, 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 we need more than just what the Bible says. And so throughout his letters, John is reaching and re responding to this Gnosticism, this this inclusion of, of wisdom and truth, that human truth and wisdom. You make up your own truth, you make up your own wisdom, and that's your religion. And the connection here, in response to this Gnosticism, John is saying, take a walk. Instead of going to this Gnosticism and relying on your truth and your wisdom, he's saying, don't forget Christians in Asia Minor, in Madison County, Nebraska, Take a walk. Take a walk with the Lord your God through his precious holy word. And that's our theme for tonight, this weekend. Take a walk. But certainly we remember the blessings, the blessings that come along with walking with our dear Savior God. And then, after we're reminded of those blessings, because we have that blessing, those blessings of walking with our Savior God, we have the blessings of walking with one another. Take a walk. This evening, we read from John's first letter, chapter 1, beginning at verse 5. John writes, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his Son, 
purifies us from all sin. That's our text. Even today, isn't it true that darkness is a very powerful thing? You think about if you lose power at home and the fridge shuts off and, and things don't work. You say, oh, I hope it turns on before things start thawing. Oh, the lights don't work. How am I going to see darkness even today is still a powerful thing. That you think about it. The power of darkness, even some of those simple tasks that we just assume isn't a big deal become very complicated. Hypothetically, you're going to change oil after you get home from work. You get home at 10 o'clock, second, second shift, what have you. I've got to change my oil in the driveway. If you don't have light in the garage, if you don't have an extension cord with a trouble light, it's the best, it's hard. At worst, it's impossible to see. It's not the most complicated thing in the world, but it sure is nice to see what you're doing. Now, you're in a boat, you're fishing at night, doing some great nice night fishing. Get a lunker on there, he bites your line off, you don't have any light. Have you ever tried tying a hook in darkness? Getting that thin little line through the eyelet and then wrapping it around and then back through the hole? You ever tried doing that? It, at best, it's hard, hard, hard. At worst, it's impossible. And that's just physically speaking. Of course, what John here is talking about, this comparison of walking in the darkness or walking in the light, has got nothing to do with the physical light here, but it has everything to do with the spirituality, the spiritual truth of the contrast, the difference between walking in darkness, unbelief, and sin compared to the light of God's truth and God's word. And here's this aspect that, that John refers to in our text, verses 5 and 6. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. If you think it's impossible to fit a fishing line through a hook eyelet and then wrap it around the line and then back through the hole in the dark, magnify that times a gazillion and say, here's the impossibility of salvation. Here's the impossibility of eternal life in heaven, walking in darkness, walking in unbelief without Jesus Christ. You think about the reality of that walking in darkness, and for a while I would say our sinful natures can have fun with that, right? Do whatever I want to do. I'm the king of the universe. I make decisions for what I want to do and forget anybody else in my life. And eventually, walking in the darkness... There's an awful lot of stumbling. There's an awful lot of running into walls. And eventually, walking in that darkness is going to catch up with me. Yeah, it can be fun for a while that I can have sex with anybody and anybody I want to whenever I want to, but eventually that's going to catch up with me emotionally, physically. Yeah, I can walk in darkness and do what my sinful nature wants and do the, the, the drinking and the drugs and whatever I want to do and say, oh, this is fun. But eventually, walking in the darkness is going to catch up with me. But ultimately, the worst part of walking in darkness, I'm never going to hear about Jesus Christ. I'm never going to hear about how my sins are forgiven. And so this is where that wonderful truth is, that when we're reminded to take a walk, take a walk, not in the darkness, but in the light, the light of Jesus Christ. How many verses, how many sections in Scripture Talk about this contrast between the darkness of unbelief and the light of salvation. That it's through Jesus that our sinful natures take over so many times anyway, even as Christians, that my sinful nature likes to go back to that darkness. But thankfully our gracious God comes to us, reaches out to us and says, here's the flashlight, here's the spotlight, here's the truth of forgiveness, the forgiveness of sins. And I'm just going to read a few verses that talk about this, this reality, this blessing that, that comes with the light of Jesus Christ and salvation. Paul writes in 2 Timothy, Our Savior Christ Jesus has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Psalm 27, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. 
of whom shall I be afraid? And then Psalm 119 talks about this light, that okay, it's great to have this light of salvation right now, but then this light of salvation also shines for me how to live, how it guides my life, right? The familiar words of Psalm 119, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. The Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran, what's the last word? Synod. When you know what that word means? That's the bigger church body to which our congregation is a part and which we as individuals who are members of St. Paul's are also members of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran. Synod means walking together. It comes right from a Greek word. And that Greek word is not used specifically right here in our text in 1 John, but it is a good picture of the reality of the blessing that we get because of that light of salvation that is in our hearts through the gift of faith. That you think about, I think about that big picture of synod walking together. Take a walk because our Savior God walks with us. We walk together. I think of the huge blessing that we have as a church body, as a congregation, as individuals walking together, sharing the same doctrines, sharing the same teaching, not, not arguing about anything. This last week, well, I suppose Saturday, this week yet, was able to join with 25 other pastors in Omaha from all over the Nebraska district. One guy came from California, from Minnesota, from Wisconsin. What did we do? We talked about, we walked together saying, oh, let's remind ourselves, grow together in God's word. Very, very fun to go to a meeting, a summer school thing like this, and not debate, not argue about doctrine, but agree and say, oh, let's reinforce to one another these doctrines, these truths from Scripture around which our synod walks together around. And then you narrow that down from the big picture of synod, congregations throughout the world walking together in truth and the truth of God's holy word, and then you narrow it down to our congregation, St. Paul's, walking together in the truth and the light of God's word. We have all kinds of meetings, and I've said this before, but isn't it a wonderful blessing that in all those meetings, even though there's disagreements, different ideas about how to do this or how to do that, you know, what we never argue about or debate about are the truths from Scripture, right? There's never been a discussion to say, well, God didn't create the universe in six days. Well, that Trinity thing, how can three persons be one God? Well, that dual nature of Jesus Christ, eating and drinking Jesus' body of blood. You know, you ever think about that? What a blessing it is not to have that argument or those arguments. But what a blessing through the light of the gospel, the light of the gospel that has shined into our hearts. There is this, this blessing of, of unity, walking together in the, truth and script, in the truth and purity of God's holy word. But then we can even narrow that down a little bit more, and saying on an individual basis, if you're walking with your friend wherever it is, around Skyview or wherever, what a blessing. What a blessing it is to have that Christian fellowship, that Christian friendship, that you're having this conversation with a dear friend and you don't have to be cool by spitting out a four-letter word twice in every sentence, that you don't have to be cool and talk about the immoral life and the immoral, ungodly plans that you have for the weekend. Rather to have a conversation, rather to have a fellowship, that's the word, the English word that we have in our text here, to have this, this mutual companionship, this mutual Christian friendship that shows itself in our everyday lives, a friendship, a fellowship that we get to enjoy with each other's Christian friendship, each other's Christian fellowship, all results because of that light of the gospel that is there in God's holy word and is there for us to use and to grow in every day of our lives, the reality of taking a walk. That you think of that term, take a walk, right? You could really understand it in two ways. Take a walk, right? 
somebody says it in that kind of a tone, it's not a good tone. Take a hike. Get out of here. I don't want you to be around. Take a hike. Take a walk. Thankfully, our Savior God has not said or used that tone with us, right? Didn't use it with Adam and Eve. Doesn't use it with us. Rather, there's that loving invitation. Invitation on a daily basis through his grace and through his word. Let's take a walk. Incredible. Incredible the blessings that we have through his grace that we're able to walk with God through that gift of faith. And because of that blessing of faith, what a blessing, what a blessing it is that you and I, as fellow Christians, get to walk with one another in that same fellowship, that same truth and purity. Let's always take a walk with Jesus. Amen. Would you please stand? Now may the grace of God, which surpasses all our understanding, guard and keep us in the one true faith until we reach eternal life in heaven. Amen. Thank you, offering. And again, for our prayers, and also, I suppose, as we conclude our service here tonight, uh, including a couple of sisters and a brother in our prayers tonight, uh, sisters being um, Judy Schrader and Corrine Swagger. Um, Judy Schrader uh, worked, out, <laughs> worked out very handily, at least for me. Uh, Judy Schrader took a, a fall, uh, when was that, Tuesday, Tuesday, or Monday, Monday afternoon, something like that. Anyway, she, long story short, broke her back, basically, keeping it uh, simple terms. And so she got flown to Omaha and um, is doing well. She's on a road to recovery. And, and you know, since I was down there already, was able to easily head over there. But uh, so she's, she's a hurting unit with that, that reality. Corrine Swagger, nothing extraordinary to report. Um, She's only getting weaker and weaker, and sometime before too long, sure looks like the good Lord's going to take her to heaven, keeping Corrine in our prayers. And then Pastor Schlewe, maybe you saw him walk in with a sling. Uh, 
Pastor Schliwe took advantage of, of doctors and medicines at technology and had a pacemaker put in. Things went well. Uh, he's got to wear that sling for a while. If you want a personal report, talk to Carol or talk to the pastor, and they'll give it to you. But thanking the Lord for a, a successful surgery and, and the blessing of, of a technology like that. So let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, the prophet Micah described you as both a king and a shepherd. It's obvious that I need your leadership and authority in my life as a king, but also the loving guidance and correction from you as my good shepherd. There's nothing more comforting and peaceful than hearing your voice through scripture that calls me to your grace and mercy. We know that you are in control of all things for the benefit of your church. Help us to resist the voices and temptations around us that want to ignore you or deny your existence. Keep us faithful to you and your word in all that we think, say, and do. We also come to you on behalf of Judy Schrader, Corrine Swagger, and Pastor Schliwe, all of whom are experiencing weak health. We thank you for the various ways that you are caring for this brother and these sisters and use their doctors, nurses, and medicines for their best possible care. Bring healing and comfort to all who are weak and sick, and always remind them of the best and only care that comes through the grace of Jesus Christ. Send the Holy Spirit into their hearts that they may be refreshed and strengthened by the good news of forgiveness and the eternal home in heaven waiting for all Christians. Dear Lord, please bless the continuing work on our school edition. Keep the workers safe and move us all to continue supporting this effort through our prayers and offerings. We ask for these and all things in your name, because you have also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. receive with believing hearts the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you his peace. Our closing hymn. 